eight, nine, <laughs> ten. And we're live. Woo. Hello, everyone. It is Mary Judd here, the co-founder of Songwriting with Soldiers. I'm happy to have you tune in today for our creatively strong interview with the one and only Gary Burr, one of our Songwriting with Soldiers songwriters, Hall of Fame songwriter, all around good guy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Gary. Glad uh, to be here. And for those of you who are not familiar with Songwriting with Soldiers, because we know these interviews are reaching more and more people every time we do them, we are a nonprofit organization based in Nashville, Tennessee. We've been around since 2012. And what we do is we pair professional songwriters with active duty military members, veterans, military families, and a group of creative professionals for retreats and workshops and special events that we hold around the country. And we do this in order to help our military community turn their stories into songs. And we use this collaborative songwriting experience as a catalyst to build more creativity, connections, and strengths. And we believe that by doing this, oh, and I'm echoing somewhere. Do you hear me echoing, Gary? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, we'll see if we can fix that. Maybe Caleb can help me. Uh, but what we do is we're building the creativity, connections, and strengths in order to build more views of what's possible, build more community and more resilience, more hope in this world. We see it happen time and time again. And we will share some of the stories behind these songs and these experiences today through our conversation with Gary Burr. Gary has been writing with us since, I think your first retreat was in Texas in 2015. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, three, four, a uh, couple of concerts and yeah. yep. probably 10 to 15 songs you've written with us. Yes, yeah, it's been wonderful. Well, we'll get into that a little bit later, but let's talk first about how you got into the songwriting world. When did you start and how did you know this was your this was your groove. You know what? It's, um, this is what happened. I went to Woodstock, the original Woodstock. Mm -hmm. And I went there with this guy that I didn't know at all, but he had a car and he was going. So I jumped in his car. And by the time we were done, he was my best friend. And he <laughs> was a drummer. And I was starting to learn how to play the guitar. And we, during Woodstock, we decided that when we came back to town, we would start a band. And so we started a band. We, we kept our, our oath. We came back to town. We started a band. And we were playing everybody else's songs, Birds and Beatles and Stones. And at one point, everybody in the band noticed that the bands whose songs we were playing, the guitar player wrote the songs. So I was the guitar player. So they all turned to me and said, you're supposed to write our songs. You're the guitar player. So I did. I basically uh, ripped off, like totally ripped off a Neil Young song where, you know, it was like I wanted to meet him in court or something. It was like brutal. But the guys in the band loved it and they learned it. And we were, we'd play a show and we would do a song that I made up in my head and I was hearing it being played. And it was the greatest, most inspiring experience to have something like that happen. And um, I gradually got better and better and better until it got to the point where one of the guys in the band said, your songs sound as good as what I'm hearing on the radio. You should do something with them. And that's when I you know, started recording my songs, sending them to people and trying to get an actual career going. And that worked. And here I am talking to you today, um, 50 years after Woodstock, and I haven't done a decent day's work since. <laughs> so that's when that's... you're calling. Oh, yeah, I did kind of. I mean, to tell you the truth, I wrote songs because I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to have a record deal. My idols were Neil Young, Jackson Brown. I wanted to be that one of those guys. So I wrote songs for me to sing. And I actually got a record deal 
shortly after I started recording my songs, I got a record deal out of New York City, but the record company went out of business like two days after they put my album out. And from that point on, I said, well, you know what? I'll try to sell my songs to other artists while I look for another deal. And now 35, 40 years later, I'm still looking for the deal, but I have managed to sell a lot of songs <laughs> to people. Well, let's hear, let's hear a little bit about that transition from the more, the early songwriter into when you started working with some of the names that a lot of people who are listening have heard. Uh, we see in your bio that you've written with everyone from, well, you've written with Juice Newton. Was that one of your like top hits that you've had? I know you've had several. So who would you say are the biggest people that you've written with that really, you felt like you were really in that zone with the best? Right. To clarify, Juice Newton recorded the first song of mine that I ever wrote. I'm, I'm sorry, the first song that I ever had recorded, she recorded it. I wrote it by myself. I've never written with her. Um, but but once I, that hit sort of came accidentally. Um, I wrote this song. Somebody in New York heard it. They loved it. We did a demo of it and sent it around the country and somebody grabbed it for Juice Newton. The next thing I know, I'm on the radio. Um, <laughs> and we were asking yeah. that your song. <laughs> yeah. That was a huge yeah. hit. Loved it. it was amazing. Uh, I One night I actually went to see her perform and she opened for Peter, Paul and Mary. And I was sitting in the audience listening to her sing my song and the whole audience was singing along. <laughs> and it was just, it was just magic. But that opened the door. I started to go down to, the door that opened was Nashville. I was sending songs to New York City, LA, and Nashville. And because I was sort of a Jackson Brown, Neil Youngy kind of a guy, New York wasn't interested. LA wasn't interested. They were doing different kinds of music. But Nashville, who and Nashville likes a good story song, they saw the potential. And I started coming down and I started writing. First person I ever wrote with in Nashville was Vince Gill. Hmm. <laughs> how did that happen quick like how'd that happen would come to town and i came to town basically with the guy that helped me get that juice newton cut and he was just bringing me to town to just introduce me to people mm -hmm. <clears throat> and one night we were just at this restaurant that was right on music row the main street where all the music industry is and they introduced me to Vince Gill, and it was one of those, you guys should write. Okay, he wasn't Vince Gill yet, and I was still Gary Burr with no capital letters. So we said, sure. And the next time I came to town, we met at a Shoney's hotel room, and we wrote a couple of songs. And that introduced me to the whole idea of, of co-writing, which was mm -hmm. a kind of a foreign thing. You know, you never think that Rembrandt ever co-painted. I thought it was a weird thing. So, um, mm. but I started writing with more and more people and bigger and better people until you have enough going that you get signed to a big publishing company. And then their job is to put you in a room with constantly with people who are either better than you so that you could get better or people that have careers so that you can grab their little coattails for dear life and ride those suckers. So that's when I started to be able to write with Carol King and Olivia Newton-John and Kenny Loggins and Ringo and people like that. Desmond Child, um, John Bon Jovi. You work your way up until you're sort of an established name and they will take your phone calls and spend an afternoon with you. What do you remember, it's like a, a highlight that you learned from one of the people that you've written with, were there any just like, whoa, something that really affected you that you've taken with you ever since? Yes, because co-writing is such a huge part of what we do down here in Nashville and in the whole songwriting world. It's more co-writing now in the pop world than ever was in the country world. You'll have eight people on a song. One of the first people, I did an interview 
And in the interview, they asked me, who haven't you written with that you'd like to write with? And I said, jokingly, I said, Paul McCartney and Harlan Howard. Harlan Howard was the dean of country songwriters. He, all the way back to, you know, Tiger by the Tail and, and, and songs with Patsy Cline. So the interview comes out in a magazine and the next day my phone rings and it's Harlan. Oh, wow. Young man, mm -hmm. come over next Wednesday and we'll write a song. And uh, I was sort of the new guy in town. I was the new hot thing that everybody was watching and I had a lot of smoke coming off me. So I went into the writing appointment and I was, I was going to prove him all right. I was going to knock him on his ass. I was going to impress him. I was going to just do everything I can. I was ready. And I walk into the room and it's full of smoke. You see chain smoked, like unfiltered camels. It was brutal. I machete my way over to his desk and he's sitting there and I sit down. And what he said to me that day is something that I say all the time, because when you reach a certain point in the business, you're being sent young writers who they want to learn from you. Mm -hmm. So I sat down and Harlan looked at me and he took a puff and he said, young man, you and I are going to write a great song. <laughs> Probably won't be this one. <laughs> and it hit me. We're not there to write a hit. We're there to start a relationship. Mm. Start a relationship and somewhere down the line, the, 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 the personalities will click and the brains will m meld and you'll write a great song. But to put that kind of weight on you for the first time, relax. We're not doing brain surgery here. We probably won't write something great, but let's have a really good time and the other thing Harlan said to me is, if we don't have a really good idea to start with, let's go drink. <laughs> so did you guys come up with a good song eventually? It was, it was a, <laughs> we came up with a song and that led to writing about 10 songs with him before he passed away. Mm, wow. I don't think I killed him, but he still passed away. <clears throat> Any other tips that you have for a lot of the people in our community, you know, uh, in our veteran community and beyond, they're they're very interested in songwriting and, and some of them much more so after attending our retreats and, and seeing you guys really exhibit the absolute mastery of craft. What do you have, do you have any insight telling this, this group of this community right now and kind of giving themselves that permission? Well, motivated? what do you say? Yeah, obviously, you know, all the stuff about you got to put the time in. You're going to write crappy songs, but songwriting is a muscle. Every time, you know, you're not doing the perfect push-up when you get started, but eventually you get real good at push-ups. You know, songwriting is like building a house. In the beginning, just be content to build something that doesn't fall down. <laughs> and then once you get, once you've written a hundred of those, you'll be able to do those in your sleep. And then it's time to write a house with a balcony. <laughs> and then you'll write that. And then you'll do a hundred of those until that'll be, you can't not write a house with a balcony. Then you can write a house with a balcony and a billiard room. Little by little, you will learn until you can't write a bad song. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that they're going to be great. It just means that, they, that you're too good to write anything bad. And the other, thing, the other thing that's the tricky part, and this is where you either have this gift or you don't have this gift. Songwriters, true songwriters, observe the world in a different way. They don't watch movies the way other people do. They don't read books. The way, they don't even watch commercials the way other people do. We're always, we've always got a bell in our head when somebody says something that goes off and you go, Ooh, if you switch those two words around from what that guy just said, that's a great song idea. And it is, so, I can't stress it enough. If you have just 20 minutes ago, uh, my wife, Georgia, who's done a lot of these retreats more than me, mm -hmm. we just wrote a song with a country group here at the house. 
And the idea was so good that the song writes itself. It just tells you where it wants to go because your idea was good to begin with. And those ideas are the things that over the course of the day, you're supposed to hear and put down in your phone or write it down in your car or something. You, you know, we're songwriters are always taking notes on life. And that's the difference. If you don't have that gene, then you're never really going to be as good a songwriter as you could be because your ideas, I'm telling you, if you just want to write a song, let's write a song about a guy who's in love with a girl. That sounds like the worst day ever because, you know, what do you say that hasn't been done? What do you say that isn't a cliche? Let's write a song about a three-legged dog that adopts a duck. That'll be done in half an hour because it writes itself. You know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Have you written I don't, why, I don't know why there's not more of those songs about three-legged dogs, but that's just me. How about that Tom T. Hall song, I Love Little Baby Ducks? Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, sure. I love little baby ducks. Yep. I'm telling you, you know, I'm, that song writes itself. Plus, list songs are really fun. Well, how many have you written, Gary? How many songs? Well, probably in the three to 4,000 range. I mean, there was a time there back in the 90s where I went into the office every day and every week I wrote six songs because one of the days I either, I probably had a, a nighttime write as well as a daytime write. Or if I didn't, I'd write a song over the weekend. And I kept that up for 15 years. Yeah. You know, and then when I cut back, I only cut back to maybe three songs a week. But imagine six songs a week, every week, take maybe three weeks off because I'm either traveling or Mm -hmm. sick or on vacation. I, I can't even count that high, you know, it's, it's just, it's what I, it's what I do. I can't not do it. Well, by the time you came to your first retreat with us, you had written thousands of songs. So what was that like coming into this new arena, writing with sitting down one-on-one with veterans? What well, did you, think would, what did you think it would be like and what was it like? It was exactly like I thought it was going to be really humbling and really scary and hard. The first one, Mm -hmm. the next one. Why was that? It's one thing to sit in a room writing with somebody and you say, so what's going on with you? And they answer, ah, you know, my wife got mad at me last night because I left the toilet seat up and she didn't talk to me. But then at nine o'clock I made her a biscuit and she was happy again. Maybe there's a song in there. (laughs) Okay. Maybe. But when you ask that same question to these men and women, Mm -hmm. you get, if they're willing to share to the degree that most of these people are, you're getting stories that, you know, the jaw doesn't drop far enough for what you're hearing. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're sitting with somebody and they're, our job is to not write a song about a three-legged dog that adopts a duck as popular as that would be. Our job is to take, to help them turn what their experience or experiences were and help them turn it into a song that maybe can help them articulate it where they couldn't before. That's that's the big difference when you're sitting there and you're hearing them tell this story And then it's a big responsibility. It was a really intimidating responsibility that, I mean, you're sitting across from somebody and, and, you know, he's going, yeah, I mean, I have trouble sleeping. And you're saying to yourself, all right, well, I have trouble sleeping, but I can't write a song about it. Yeah, I keep, you know, when I hear noises at night, it wakes me up. 
And I say to myself, yeah, I mean, when I hear a noise, I uh, says, you know, because I was driving and my best friend was in the in the vehicle next to me and, and we heard this loud boom and he got blown up and killed. And then you're saying, that's where we part company. I have not had that happen. And that's when you're going, you know, how do you, and the trick to it is nobody's, 0. 0.000, thankfully, 0.0001% of the people in the world have had that experience. Mm -hmm. But we've all experienced loss, shock, helplessness. As professional songwriters, the burden is we have to then listen to that detailed and tragic a story and try to turn it into something a little more universal, but still has enough of the, the storyteller's mm -hmm. heart and, and experience in the song so that he gets out of it what he signed up for the weekend to get out of it. You can't just turn it around and, well, let's just write a love song, but then the girl leaves, and that's lost, and that's kind of like what you experience, right? No, it's not. The girl left him, yeah, but she didn't get blown out of a window in 50 pieces. So a little different. It's very intimidating. It's very scary. It goes as well as how the soldier wants to open up. However willing he's open, he or she is willing to open up about what they've got inside them, that will dictate how much would you have to build the house? See how, how much, I back around to the house? Right. Thing? Yeah. So how much do you think that your 15, 20, 30, 40 years of experience writing songs equips you to do this work? Because you write these songs in two hours, two and a half hours, a few a weekend, and perform them all in front of everyone. It's a lot of pressure. How much does your experience and expertise play in? A lot. Once again, I know that I can build the house. I'm not worried about it. I know that we'll walk out of there. I have that kind of confidence. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that I walk out of there with a song that makes them have tears in their eyes when I play it that night for them. That's when I know that I did my job, mm -hmm. which I have a simple job. I just have to make their job a little less like hell. So I do the best I can for that. You know, I've written thousands of songs. I'm not worried about coming up with a good melody or a good chord progression. Now it's just mm. down to, am I a good listener? Mm. And that's what I was afraid of when I got there. Would I be a good listener? And could I send it back out in a way that brings the tears to his eyes? And um, I think so far I've done fine. The next time there's a retreat, I'm gonna go in there feeling like I can't do this. That's the way I go to all of them. Mm -hmm. I can't do this. I'm at the last second. I'm hoping, please let them call and say <laughs> there was an earthquake or something and we're not doing it because this is- There's a pandemic, sorry, Gary. <laughs> yeah, I will be yeah. exposed as the fraud that I know I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I have a sister who speaks a lot, and she said, when you're nervous, it means you care. So, Yeah, yeah. We yeah. do go into it. Mm -hmm. We are not phoning it in. Mm -hmm. You know, these guys, these men and women deserve our full attention and the full brunt of the 10,000 hours that we've put in to become the, uh, the songwriters that we are. Well, we see it time and again and are so grateful to you, Gary, for all of that, for your integrity and your your hard work, your confidence. It really comes out. In, and right now, it's just it's such a great display of of really being able to meet people where they are and put our own agendas aside and really listen and do something in support of each other, Absolutely. which is such a so needed. We all know that it's really needed right now. Um, how, has this a work, in addition to what you just said, is there any other way that this work has, has changed you? Are you a different person because of it? 
in any way? <laughs> Absolutely. And I'll tell you the, I'll tell you the story that is the best example of that. I was writing with a guy uh, named Grizz. That was his nickname. Mm -hmm. And he was a mess. He had, I mean, he was doing everything he could to just end it. He was just drugs, booze, jumping on a motorcycle and driving 100 miles an hour and crashing. He had just gotten out of the hospital. He had all these plates in his body. Mm -hmm. And it took him three times before he actually came to the retreats. Probably because he just didn't know whether he wanted to be fixed or stay broken. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the end of the retreat, he was kind of like, he, he showed up and he looked like a biker guy and he was scary and he was, you know, <laughs> angry and standoffish. And by the end of it, he was, he was Jerry Lewis. He was running around telling jokes. He was this, he was that. He was just, it was a great transformation and he got a lot out of it. And on the last morning that we were there, I said to him, I said, uh, you know, what do you do? And he says, oh, I, I'm in my dad's business. Um, I do not. Hmm? Here he is. There you go. <laughs> He's the one. Yeah, on the left. <laughs> so, so he says, every morning I put on this suit, this heavy suit and a, and a helmet. And I go out in the Texas heat and I carve the numbers and letters on tombstones. That's the family business. And, you know, he, I said, oh, my God, it must be a million degrees out there. He said, oh, yeah, it gets real hot. We have to go out at like four in the morning and we're done by 11 because we can't take the heat. I said, well, with, your, with all that stuff on you and the helmet and stuff, it must be like you're back in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Th that sounds awful. He says, no, it's great. I said, why is it great? He goes, nobody's shooting at me. <laughs> yeah. And that has become a... a, a a phrase for Georgia and I, whenever we're feeling stressed about something, we look at each other and go, you know, look around. Mm -hmm. Nobody's shooting at us. We can handle this. Imagine if we had to handle this and people were shooting at us. Yeah. Nobody's shooting at us. The <laughs> stuff they've gone through, mm -hmm. you know, I'm really, I'm really glad uh, Grizz came to that retreat. He, yeah, he, he changed me. Well, it sounds like it was mutual. I've talked to Grizz lately and he's married. He has a baby. He has a house. So your song helped bring that house <laughs> around great. again, Gary. Yeah. That's many, great. many stories like that. Yeah. So I know I speak on behalf of a lot of people, participants and their family and others who have been affected by these songs. Thank you. Thank you for doing it. Well, glad to Thank be part of it. <laughs> So what are you all working on now? I know there's a lot that you're, you guys are still very busy in spite of the pandemic, you're in demand and you guys are putting work out there. Tell us what you're doing and then uh, treat us to something, your big surprise. Oh, it's not a big surprise, but um, Georgia and I, uh, you know, everybody's doing digital shows and there's some platforms out there and Georgia and I do one every Wednesday night on this platform called uh, Stage It at 8.30 Nashville time. And uh, it's just us playing our hits and our other songs that we have written that we love. I've played, we've played a few uh, of the Songwriting with Soldier songs on that. Mm -hmm. And every Sunday we do a FaceTime show at two o'clock in the afternoon so that our, the people that know us that live in England and Ireland, they can tune in because it's like eight o'clock at night. And uh, I wanted to accomplish something during this pandemic and be able to look at it as, you know, as, as achieving something. So I wrote a book while, mm -hmm. while the pandemic's been going on, and that's out on the desks of publishers at the moment. And um, that's exciting. Yeah, very exciting. And, and, um, and I've written, you know, 
Georgia and I wrote a whole album of pandemic songs. Every Saturday we wrote a song. And after 10 weeks, we had an album's worth of pandemic songs. And sometime during that, I wrote one by myself that uh, they, a company asked me for something and, and, and I wrote a song that ended up uh, being played all over the country as a, as a quarantine pandemic sort of song. And uh, I was actually thinking I would play that for you. <laughs> you can't stop me. This song is called When the Sun Comes Out. Oh, look, it's all me all the time. Yay. We have faced war and woe. There were times we thought we'd all gone as far as we could go. When the hurting stops, the healing starts, and the struggle cannot change us, because we know in our hearts we're going to come back even stronger, stand up even taller, throw our arms around each other, send our prayers up to the sky. There's no fight that lasts forever, so let's face the battle, fight together the day may seem deep and dark right now but we'll all be here to shine when the sun comes out take the blows cry the tears but remember that the light of love can calm the darkest fears we endure we survive there's a light on that horizon, and when that dawn arrives, we're gonna come back even stronger, stand up even taller, throw our arms around each other, send our prayers up to the sky. There's no fight that lasts forever, so let's face the battle, fight together the day may seem deep and dark right now. But we'll all be here to shine when the sun comes out. We're gonna shine, we're gonna shine. When our burdens all get left behind, we're gonna come back even stronger, stand up even taller, throw our arms around each other, send our prayers up to the sky. There's no fight that lasts forever, so let's face the battle. Fight together today may seem deep and dark right now. But we'll all be here to shine when the sun comes out. Yeah, we'll all be here to shine when the sun comes out. You're muted. You're muted. Ah. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> it was beautiful. I was singing. Oh, good. <laughs> I hate to miss Thank a compliment from beauty. How can we hear that song again? Is it on your website? Where can we hear it? I don't know. Ask me to do this again and I'll sing it again. All right. I, uh, I like it live. Uh, I don't know. I'm terrible at that. I'm sure it's out there somewhere. Well, GaryBurr.com, is that the best website to find you? Or is it GaryBurr.com is the best one. Also, uh, my wife and I have our duo, Georgia Middleman. So MiddlemanBurr.com. That's where you get all the information about our shows. And I'll bet you that song is up there. And if it isn't, I'll put it up there. MiddlemanBurr.com. I'll Great. put that song up there so that you can hear it if anybody liked it. All right. And we will put it out on our, our list. I'm sure many people will come back and watch this interview and be inspired, be uh, feel a little bit better. I'm a little bit more hopeful after that song. It's beautiful. Uh, it's, it's a rough time for a lot of people right now. And in the middle of a Friday afternoon to hear that song, to know what you've been through, to know what so many people have been through in our community. Um, it's it's such a good example of keep doing it, keep creating, keep putting ourselves out there, keep 
striving for hope and connection and support. So thank you. Know, you. That is what's important right now. I, I mm -hmm. was thinking about that. I, I have, I have written songs when I'm sick. I've written songs when I was going through divorces. I've written songs while I've been waiting for medical test results to come back. Mm -hmm. I can certainly write songs while I'm quarantined in a house with cable TV with a thousand channels. <laughs> it's not a hardship. It's what I do. And, uh, and it's one of the easier times to write mm -hmm. songs because uh, we're all going through a lot of emotions right now. And, um, you know, yeah. songwriters are supposed to turn all that into something pretty. <laughs> struggle, struggle well, as some of our good friends at Boulder Crest say. Uh, That's making, nice. Yeah. Making post-traumatic growth, you know, turning our pain into beautiful things that can be shared and, and help relieve other people's pain. It's worth it. And often people don't do the creative pursuits because they think it's selfish. Or they think, oh, that's just not, I shouldn't be doing that right now. I should be doing this. But we should be caring and helping people, definitely. We should also be doing the things that we know fuel us and, and give us life. And if we're creating things that can inspire other people, uh, we definitely need to be doing that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like if I know we're all struggling but if there isn't art and music and that out there, why are we bothering to struggle? I think Winston Churchill said that when they said, we need money for the war, so we're gonna shut down all the art programs and cancel the symphony and, all this and, and take all that money and put it into the war effort. And he said, if you cancel all that stuff, what are we fighting for? Mm. So mm -hmm. that's why that's, that's our job during the pandemic, a little bit of normalcy and uh, to try to create something mm -hmm. fulfilling and, and uh, beautiful out of it. Right. Carry on, carry on well. Thank you, Gary. Middleman Burr for everybody, go check it out. Middleman Burr, songwritingwithsoldiers.org. If you want to support our program, support us being able to bring in fabulous talent like Gary Burr and the many other songwriters, the many other artists that we bring in, photographers, videographers, workshop presenters. Um, we're doing our best good work to keep building bridges, building community, building creativity and strengths, bringing people, elevating to move forward. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you again, Gary, for joining me today, all of us. Everyone stay well, stay creative, stay in touch. Bye, everybody. Bye.